First up, I understand George Monbiot. It's a great pleasure um, from The Guardian, author of Feral, and he's going to speak for about 45 minutes, and I'm very excited to hear it. Thank you, George. <coughs> Well, thank you very much, Roger. Thank you, Ian, and thank you, everybody, for coming. It's um, a great honour, especially to be sharing the stage with one of my heroes, Alan, um, who anyone who's read my book, Feral, will know that he is the undisputed hero of the story. Um, and I'll obviously be leaving all the hard work to him tonight. I'm going to begin by pointing out just what a thoroughly weird country we live in. Um, the average forest cover for um, the terrestrial parts of the world, obviously there's not much forest cover in the non-terrestrial parts of the world, including the ice caps and um, the, desert, the, the desert areas and the high mountains and the rest of it, is 31%. The average European forest cover is 37%. The average forest cover in the United Kingdom is 13%, one three. And of that, a substantial proportion is plantations of exotic conifers, which aren't of a great deal of interest to ecologists like me. We have this very strange situation where we are almost naked. Why might this be? Well, if you go to almost any other European country, Ireland is the other exception, you will see what you will, would expect to see, that the great wildlife refuges, the great rich ecosystems, are on the land which isn't really worth farming. And that, by and large, means the uplands. There, the climate is harsh, the soil is thin, um, there, there's not a lot that you can extract from the land. And as globalisation has kicked in and made uh, the less fertile parts of the world less competitive um, due to the global market in food, farmers have gradually retreated from the uplands and they have reforested. Um, and right across Europe, almost every country you go in in Europe, you'll find across the hills, even in countries like Belgium, that the hills are almost entirely covered with trees. And the lowlands are largely bare, which is what you would expect, because that's where the fertile land is. You come to Britain, and you find that the lowlands are largely bare, again, as you would expect, but the uplands, the land not worth farming, the land which you would expect to be the great wildlife refuges, are even barer. There is scarcely anywhere in Britain where there are trees above about 200 metres. It's an extraordinary phenomenon. Uh, it's almost unique worldwide that we have barer uplands and lowlands in places which are below the tree line. And almost all of Britain is below the tree line, as Alan will be eloquently explaining later on. And yet, it looks like tundra. The uplands look like the sort of ecosystem you would expect if you were above the Arctic Circle. Well, why is this the case? First of all, let's look at the agents of this destruction, for destruction is what it is. This is not a natural phenomenon. This is not um, a, um, a, a topographic phenomenon. And it's not, not an environmental phenomenon. It's been done by people, and there are three principal agents of this destruction in ascending order of importance. Important, but least important among the three, is grouse shooting. And we have these large grouse estates, in, especially in the north of England and over many parts of Scotland, um, where the land is um, cut, burnt and grazed in order to try to optimise the conditions for this one species, the red grouse, which is shot at a cost of several thousand pounds per person <coughs> per day. Um, and in order to optimise the conditions, you burn off the heather so that you get the young shoots coming up which the grouse eat. You incidentally also kill all the predators, all the competitors, and flood the towns downstream. What's not to like? Um, the uh, next, uh, the, the more important than that in terms of land area covered, it's a very similar phenomenon, really, and there's some overlap between the two, and that's deer stalking. This is what you see over vast areas of the Scottish Highlands, um, which are, again, effectively wet deserts. There's um, almost no woody vegetation at all. 
Um, large parts look like bowling greens with contours, a lot of contours and rocks sticking out, but basically very low cropped vegetation, as we'll be hearing more from, lo lots more from Alan about. Um, and, and these um, areas have been reduced to that state by deer kept at livestock-like densities. Um, so many deer, in some cases 30 deer, 40 deer per square kilometer, that it's simply impossible for woody vegetation to take root. In, in um, deer, like uh, a lot of other grazing and browsing animals, selectively seek out tree seedlings because they're highly nutritious. And it's not till you get down in these infertile places to uh, five or 10 deer per square kilometer that trees can start coming back. So um, uh, uh, there's 100 hectares for every square kilometre, that means one deer per 10 hectares at most. But they're kept at these very high densities so that um, uh, a banker paying large amounts of money to waddle around on the wars, moors in tweeds and with a rifle can pretty <coughs> well fire a shot at random and kill a stag. But most important in terms of the land area affected <coughs> is my old friend, the um, woolly ruminant from Mesopotamia, the White Plague the sheep. And our uplands, by and large, particularly in England and Wales, of course, have been comprehensively shagged by the woolly maggots. They have been sheep wrecked. Um, and, and this one industry has done, in my view, more damage, has removed more ecosystems, has, has stripped away more vegetation, has displaced more wildlife than all the industry that has ever taken place in Britain than all the building which has ever been done in Britain. It's a tiny, vanishingly small industry in, in, in economic terms. Uh, it is fantastically unproductive. To give you an example, 76% um, of the land area of Wales is under livestock production, almost all of it sheep, almost all of it for meat. Wales imports by value seven times as much meat as it exports. So despite setting aside three quarters of the land area of that country for meat production, it is a, by a very wide margin a net importer of meat. It is hard to think of any industry anywhere on earth with a higher ratio of destruction to production. But I still haven't answered the question. Why is it that our uplands are bare, whereas the uplands of the rest of Europe are forested. Surely, with similar sorts of countries, similar sorts of um, uh, uh, influences should prevail. Well, I've thought for a long time about this, and the only consistent explanation I can come up with is this, the pattern of land ownership. Britain, according to one estimate, and unfortunately estimates are all we have because we have a woefully incomplete land registry, has the second highest land ownership concentration in the world. According to another estimate, Scotland has the highest, if you just take Scotland by itself, the highest concentration of ownership in the world. Um, it, Britain as a whole, second behind only Brazil. While every other country just about in Europe had a revolution, we had the opposite process. Um, following the French Revolution, there was a massive redistribution of land in that country. At the very same time, um, was pretty well the height of our enclosure movement, where the big landlords were taking more land for themselves, kicking the peasants off, um, securing these great big estates. At the same sort of time, the Highland clearances were taking place in Scotland with exactly the same impacts, um, with vast numbers of people being kicked off their land and in many cases shipped overseas. In England, most of the people went to the cities, which was why England became the first largely urbanised nation on earth. And, um, <clears throat> and so the absence of that revolution has left this highly empowered, highly concentrated land-owning class in charge of the great majority of the land area of Britain. And this has done two things. One, it allows them pretty well without impediment to pursue their favoured hobbies, like grouse shooting, like deer stalking, which are 
about the most elite sports, if indeed they can be called sports, you could imagine. I mean, they, they both cost phenomenal amounts of money um, to pursue th those hobbies. Both of them, um, e despite the huge fees that people pay, tend to be loss-making. Um, they are both monocultures. Um, the huge areas of the uplands are devoted to them and to them alone. They have devastating environmental consequences, not just on site, but also, as we've been seeing recently, downstream. Because, of course, by stripping the vegetation off the land, by burning, um, um, we, we uh, see a greater susceptibility to um, flashy hydrology, to, to water flashing off the land rather than being absorbed slowly and uh, absorbed and released slowly downstream. So we see high flood peaks rising very rapidly. And if you live in Hebden Bridge, for example, you know all about the consequences. So this still doesn't quite explain why sheep farming is such a dominant activity, why we have a sheep monoculture across so many of the uplands of Britain, but not elsewhere in Europe. But again, I believe it's a land-holding pattern. But to understand this, you must first understand an even more uncomfortable fact, a, a fact you'll never see on country file, because if country file was any keener on sheep, it would be illegal. <laughs> um, and, and this fact is that despite all those, that wonderful footage of um, farmers taking their sheep to market and money changing hands and all the rest of it, they do not make their living from sheep. In economic terms, sheep in the hills are purely ornamental. Well, worse than ornamental, they are loss-making. They are massively loss-making. Um, they um, are, are, because the soil is so poor, because the climate is so harsh, they are kept at very low densities. Densities high enough to ensure that nothing can grow except a very narrow band of species, but not so high that anyone can make a living from them. So what the people um, who are farming those sheep in the hills are making a living from is the harvesting of something else entirely, farm subsidies. Every household in this country spends, on average, £245 a year on subsidising farming. And a lot of that money um, goes, uh, some of it goes into the pockets of people who simply don't need it, often the big arable farmers in the lowlands who are already quite profitable, and they put that money into such socially useful activities as horse racing, private jets, um, uh, roulette tables, second homes in Florida, and the rest of it. Um, you'd be glad to hear that your money is being spent so well. Um, in the uplands, people depend on that money because there is almost no other source of income. Um, in Wales, for example, <coughs> according to one estimate, um, the average um, subsidy taken by hill farmers is £53,000 a year. The average income at the end of the year for hill farmers is £33,000 a year. You lose £20,000 a year by chasing sheep over rain sodden hills. What's not to like? Um, and um, so we are paying for the hills to be stripped bare. But the stripping bare of the hills is not entirely an accidental byproduct of what we are paying for. It is actually a specific and precise condition of those payments. To understand this, we must understand something else about the farm subsidy regime. Well, several things. The first of those is that the great majority of the payments are paid um, to farmers for the service that they, or landowners, for the service that they um, um, render to society, which is owning the land. In other words, they are paid per hectare just for having land. And the more land you have, the more you are paid. Some people in this country, such as the Duke of Westminster, for example, make millions of pounds a year by being paid by you and me for owning land. During the Middle Ages, there was a tax known as feudal aid. Uh, feudal aid was what the vassals had to pay to the landlords for the privilege of having the landlords own the land which had just stolen off the vassals. Um, by and large, the more <coughs> land a landlord possessed, the more he would be paid in feudal aid. Feudal aid is pillar one of the common agricultural policy. That's what we have gone back to. It is the most regressive form of taxation anywhere in Europe 
possibly anywhere on Earth. And most people don't even know that we're paying it. An extraordinary thing. Why has a huge fuss not been made about this? Beats me. In June 2013, the government introduced its cap on social security payments. Um, and the cap at the time was set at £26,000 a year for, for, per household, since being brought down further from that level. In the very same month, the then Environment Secretary, Owen Paterson, went to Brussels to argue against a cap on the payments that any one landowner could receive through farm subsidies. The cap being proposed at the time by the European Commission was €300,000, which happened to translate at the exchange rates of the day to £260,000, precisely 10 times the cap which had just been imposed two days before on the ordinary recipients of Social Security in this country. He succeeded. That cap became a discretionary cap rather than a mandatory one. In other words, countries could decide whether or not they would apply it, and unsurprisingly, the Westminster government decided not to apply it, with the result that landowners in this country, some of them, are taking millions of pounds each a year. So just as the poorest people in the country were having their Social Security cut, the richest people in their country uh, had a guarantee that their social security had no upper limit whatsoever. But even then, it doesn't end, the injustice of this extraordinary situation. Because while the ordinary recipients of social security, the people at the bottom of the socioeconomic heap, um, have had more and more stringent conditions attached to the receipt of that money, such that, in some cases, people have committed suicide because they have found it impossible to live under those conditions. In a couple of cases, people have starved to death. In one recent case, a woman received a letter informing her that she was fit to work on the day she died. Um, just as all that is going on, at the same time, the conditions attached to the social security given to the richest people, farm subsidies, are being stripped away. Um, Phil Hogan, the European Agricultural Commissioner, recently announced that he was cutting those um, conditions, they're called cross-compliance, by 80%. There'd be 80% fewer inspections, there'd be a mass deregulation of what you had to do in order to receive that money. Things like not trashing watercourses and not stripping all the soil off the land. Forget about that. We're not going to enforce that anymore. You can just have the money. Here you are. These things have been taking place simultaneously, completely below the political radar. How many people knew this stuff? Put your hands up if you did. Don't you read my columns? <laughs> no, but seriously, it's, it's like it, there's this huge public silence, this socially maintained silence around this issue. Where you see a, 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 a loud social silence, if you could have such a thing, around an issue, it means that special interests are being protected. Social silences don't happen by accident. I'm not suggesting that there's a conspiracy where people get together and say, hmm, what should we be silent about? People have an instinct for avoiding conflict. <coughs> Journalists have an instinct for avoiding conflict. Editors have an instinct for avoiding conflict. All sorts of people at all levels of society have an instinct for avoiding conflict. So you just don't look at it. It's not, not as if you're deliberately turning away from it. You just sort of pass it by while sort of glancing a tiny bit out of the corner of your eye. And it just does not feature on the news agenda. So we do not hear about this staggering injustice that's taking place. But there is one condition and just one condition attached to farm subsidies which is absolute and which is never broken and which is enforced with extreme severity. And that is that the land must be in agricultural condition. Agricultural condition does not mean that it's producing anything. Agricultural condition means that it looks as if it could produce something. You don't have to produce a single lamb chop or a single ear of wheat in order to claim your farm subsidies. Simply, your land must look like it's agricultural. It must look like it's in agricultural condition, which means it must be bare. Any land containing permanent ineligible features 
is, as the name suggests, ineligible for subsidies. It's, you, uh, the map is now taken down to the level of 0 0.01 hectares. Tiny little patches of land, of this big, are excluded if they have a permanent ineligible feature on. What, you may ask, is a permanent ineligible feature? Wildlife habitat. A tree, yes, good. Any, any other bids? A tree is a permanent ineligible feature. A hedge, if it's more than two metres wide, is a permanent ineligible feature. Scrub, regenerating vegetation, permanent ineligible feature. A pond is a permanent ineligible feature. A reed bed is a permanent ineligible feature. Almost the entire suite of wildlife habitats are permanent ineligible features. Almost the entire suite of the kind of vegetation types which keep soil on the land, and while I'm on this subject, there's a magnificent ex 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 exhibition which you can see after this talk, right on this site, at the other side of reception called Soil Culture, and I'd strongly advise you to see it. The vegetation which keeps soil on the land, keeps carbon in the soil, keeps the water from wrecking homes downstream, all that is permanent ineligible features, and farmers have a massive perverse incentive to cut the whole lot so that they can claim money on their entire land area. And they do. And the reason why that has led to entirely bare hills in Britain and not in the rest of Europe appears to be as follows. That in Britain, the land holdings are large enough for the owners to make their living from the harvesting of subsidies alone. Elsewhere in Europe, they're not big enough to make that industry worth a candle, and so the young people don't follow their parents and people gradually leave the land. It's solely because our land holdings are big enough for people just to sit there, mow the land every so often in some cases, or just run a few sheep on it, which will have exactly the same impact, sit back and take the money. And they can make a living that way. That's why the land in our uplands is bare. But there's a further astonishing factor which plays upon this, which is that the very organisations that you might look to to confront these astonishing systems the, and confront the denudation of almost the entire land surface of Britain, do not confront it, but collaborate in it. And I'm talking about some of our foremost conservation bodies. Let me give you a local example. Dartmoor and Exmoor National Parks. How many people here know what swaling means? I'm not talking about the permacultural use of that word. This is a word which means something completely different from the permacultural use, a few of you. For those who don't, swaling in the West Country means burning the land. Now, in some parts of Britain, conservation authority, uh, bodies, rather, uh, like the RSPB, for instance, have worked very hard to try to stop landowners from burning the land. But here, in Dartmoor and Exmoor, the Dartmoor and Exmoor National Park authorities, which are supposed to, according to their legal mandate, conserve and enhance the natural environment and wildlife, they oversee and assist the annual burning of the land. This is scorched earth conservation. This is the destruction of almost everything by conservation bodies. The processes which, when we see them abroad, for instance, in Indonesia or Brazil, we call destruction, are here called conservation. Here is the justification the Dartmoor National Park Authority gives for burning the land. Dartmoor has been going up in flames in recent days in an environmentally friendly way and much to the delight of various ground nesting birds like skylarks and grazing livestock. I think that should say like skylarks and grazing livestock. This year, swaling has been deemed more important than ever on the moors because fewer grazing animals have been released on the highland commons over recent years, resulting in the extra growth of plants such as gorse and bracken. Let's take this revolting example of corporate doublespeak point by point. Environmentally friendly burning environmentally friendly burning. Oil companies would blush to engage in such greenwash. <laughs> it's astonishing. It's disgusting. But, of course, 
It's great because it's good for skylots. Sorry, ground nesting birds like skylots. But ground nesting birds like skylots tends to mean these days skylarks. And all over the country, you'll see conservation organizations saying, um, you know, the reason we're cutting and burning and grazing the land, the very processes, as I say, which when we see them abroad, we recognize as destruction, but when we see them in this country, we call conservation, is that it's good for skylarks. Why skylarks? Why is the skylark afforded this extraordinary privilege of being the conservation priority in place after place after place across the British uplands? <coughs> Simply because of this, that the skylark, above and beyond almost any other bird species, has an extraordinary resilience to cutting, burning and grazing. It is one of the very few species which can survive on open land without cover. The great majority of species require cover for their survival. They need places to hide from predators, to ambush prey, to escape the extremes of temperature and humidity. And there's a very small group of species which can survive in open places, and the skylark is first among them. The skylark is the last refuge of the scoundrel. But they then go on to say, and grazing livestock. And of course, that's the nub of it. This is nothing to do with conservation. This is everything to do with bashing as much grazing potential out of that land as you possibly can in a national park, in a place, according to law, has been set aside for public enjoyment and um, the, the, the enhancement and conservation of nature. It's being, uh, it's being ranched and burnt to within an inch of its life until there's almost nothing there at all except for sodding sheep in order to maximise the grazing potential. <coughs> oh, and the further justification. If we don't burn, the bracken and the gorse move in. Oh, isn't that terrible? Ecological succession is taking place. Natural processes, help! There's natural processes happening. Fetch the matches. And we all know what happens after gorse and bracken come in. Trees! Trees come! They're like triffids. You, know, you never know what they're going to do. Can't be trusted. They must be burnt before they can take hold. Because, of course, the ideal state of the moors, is, is, uh, of the uplands, is grass and heather moorland. Now, I worked for years in Indonesia, in Brazil, in East Africa, and I worked with conservationists who were constantly trying to defend the rainforests against cutting, burning and grazing, the processes which we call conservation in Britain. And, um, and in doing so, they would point me to these landscapes which, as they said, were totally devastated. There was almost nothing living there at all. There was either just rough grassland, or there was this low perennial scrub, composed of just one or two species, generally not much higher than your knee, which occasionally would come into sort of quite spectacular bloom because, they all had, because there was just one or two species, it all had the same colour and you know, from a distance. Wow, that's bright, but there was almost nothing there. It contained almost no life. Twenty years later, you know... It's, stumbling my way around Britain as ever, and it suddenly dawned on me. That's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the aftermath of repeated cycles of deforestation, cutting, burning, and grazing. And we call it Heather Moorland, and we believe that it's the most magnificent state of nature there could possibly be, and we invest vast resources in destroying all other states of nature in order to keep it in this state of arrested development, which has almost nothing there. So there are very few comparative studies for the simple reason that there's almost no native woodland in the uplands. But where you do do those studies, you find something quite astonishing. In the Cairngorms, for example, one study found <coughs> that of nationally important species, there were 13 times as many in the upland woods as there were in the moorland. As for species which occurred nowhere else in Britain, the, the woodlands there contained 100 of those species, exactly 100 as it happens. The moorland contained one species, a fungus that lives on bilberry leaves. I've just had a friend um, look it up in Norway where it turns out to be a woodland species where it lives there. 
It's, it's an astonishing thing that we've become so blind to what surrounds us, what is staring us in the face, that we have utterly and totally failed to see it. And what is staring us in the face is this, that while in other countries we try to defend the rainforest against the ranches, here we defend the ranches against the rainforest. And I'm not talking loosely here, Rainforest is forest which is wet enough to support epiphytes, plants which grow on other plants. You don't have to go very far from here to find polypody growing along the branches of the trees. You're looking at a rainforest fragment. Rainforests are the kind which once covered much of this country between about 9,000 and 5,000 years ago in the boreal and Atlantic periods after um, the uh, climate warmed up a bit following the Ice Age. The trees came back and they came back in the form of rainforest. Rainforest is what would cover, in a mosaic -y sort of pattern, it wouldn't be continuous, but it would cover much of the country today if it were allowed to come back. And it would be a far, far richer ecosystem than the ones we celebrate today. And I believe that two things have made us blind to this amazingly obvious situation, obvious only in retrospect. The first is what Antonio Gramsci, the Italian philosopher, called cultural hegemony. And cultural hegemony is the way in which societies tend to normalise and generalise the perspectives of the elite. So the elite forms a view of a situation which happens to suit its own interests, and it manages to project that view until everybody else forms the same view and thinks, yeah, it's actually a jolly good thing that we're ground underfoot by the aristocrats because we deserve it. God save the Queen. God save the Queen. <laughs> yes, a fine example. Thank you. Um, and, um, and, and, in, in, and, and in this case, perhaps, we could call it agricultural hegemony. That um, what is in the interests of the landowners, and the farmers, um, is, is, is broadcast and generalised, literally broadcast, very often, until we perceive it as being in the interests of everyone. And in this case, it has very deep cultural roots. You don't have to read very far in the Bible till you come across Genesis 5. For Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain was a tiller of the ground. We know which side we're on, ladies and gentlemen. You carry on through the Bible, it's all about the, the great sheep herding people until you come to the Good Shepherd, otherwise known as Agnes Dei, the Lamb of God. A similar parallel tradition was taking place in the classical world. In ancient Greece, a, a tradition um, um, consolidated by the, the writer, the poet Theocritus, in the 3rd century BC, of pastoral poetry. Pastoral means to do with um, pasturing animals. And pastoral poetry in its pure form means casting sheep and shepherding as the, the, the seat of innocence and purity and contrasting it with the corruption of urban life. And this tradition was developed by many other Greek poets, picked up by the Romans, Virgil, Ovid, Horace and the rest, um, and then exported to other parts of the world. During our classical, uh, classical revival here, Spencer, Marlowe, Shakespeare, they all reveled in the pastoral tradition. Uh, the Romantics later on, of course, did exactly the same, and now we see it on our televisions almost every blinking night of the week. Um, you know, all these sort of lambing live programmes and all the rest of it. That's all part of the same pastoral tradition, except it's on telly rather than in literature. Um, and so this is a very deeply ingrained cultural perspective allied to the cultural hegemony projected by the big landlords. And, um, and, and we are, are so immersed in this that we find it very hard to see our way out. But it's allied with another phenomenon, which the fisheries biologist Daniel Pauly coined as shifting baseline syndrome. And shifting baseline syndrome is the way in which every generation normalises and naturalises the state of nature that prevailed in its own youth. So I look back to my own youth and I think of the saber-toothed cats and the woolly mammoths. Um, you know, we, we look back to our own youth and, and we think of that as being the ideal state of nature. 
And we think, that's what we need to get back to because it was so much better and richer and more diverse then. Let's get back to that and then everything will be fine. And that's pretty well our conservation ethos in this country where conservation groups say, yeah, you know, farming's gone a little bit too far. We need to take it back to a sort of, sort of 1939 picture of farming. Then it'll be just ideal. That's fine. That's lovely. That's, that's the sort of farming we want to see. So, yeah, still plenty of sheep, still plenty of cutting, burning and grazing, but not quite as much as we have today. Then we'll be happy. That's what we call conservation in this country. But in doing that, in projecting that normalisation onto our own youth or a period just before our own youth, we forget that the people of that period were doing the same. And the people of that period were doing the same. And back and back and back, with every, with every generation the degradation of the natural world turning a little further along that ratchet and the forgetfulness, which is called shifting baseline syndrome, that's the term for our ecological forgetfulness, taking hold a little more with every generation until we become completely unaware of what prevailed many generations back. Let me give you some examples. Why is it possible to lay a hedge? Think of what laying a hedge entails. You, you almost sever the living wood, leaving just a tiny sliver of bark and wood. Then you twist it and split it and you trample it down. You, you do just about everything you can do to a tree which you would imagine would kill it. And yet the following spring, boof, up it comes as happy as ever before. What an astonishing adaptation that is. Isn't that an amazing thing that you could subject a tree to that degree of punishment and yet it seems perfectly happy with it? Why would it have evolved such extraordinary capacities? There didn't used to be hedges around. Deer wouldn't do that to a tree. Cattle wouldn't do that to a tree. The wind wouldn't do that to a tree. Those extraordinary impacts. Why would it go so far in, 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 in evolving these adaptations? Um, why do trees coppice and pollard? In other words, re-sprout from wherever the trunk is broken. Most interestingly, why do understory trees like holly and box and yew have so much tougher roots and branches and are so much harder to topple and to break than the big canopy trees like oak and beech and ash and elm, despite the fact that those understory trees carry far less weight and are subject to far lower shear forces from the wind? It seems utterly mystifying. Why would they be so much tougher? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I believe there is a simple explanation for all these phenomena. <laughs> elephants. <laughs> I mean it. We live in an elephant-adapted ecosystem. During the last interglacial, the Eemian, um, where the climatic conditions were almost identical to today's, the dominant herbivore here was Elephas anticus, the straight-tusked elephant. So <coughs> massive and bulky that it made the African elephant look like a ballet dancer. <laughs> it had a huge neck. Huge neck suggests it specialised in pulling down trees. It had tusks almost as long as its body, straight ones. That suggests it also specialised in ripping the bark off, which might suggest that one of the reasons why trees are so resilient to losing much of their bark as well. If trees were not able to withstand its tender affections, they would have been wiped out, just like that. Those adaptations that I've described are adaptations to elephant attack. And it's not just elephants. Well, why does blackthorn put out thorns two or three inches long when it's flailed? Again, wildly over-engineered uh, to resist attack by deer or by cattle, but not perhaps <coughs> by rhinoceros. Yes, we have two species of temperate rhinoceros in this country as well, Merck's <coughs> rhino and the narrow-nosed rhino. Why do we have so many marginal plants, the plants which live on the fringes of, of lakes and ponds and, and river meanders and the rest of it? Possibly because we also had Hippopotamus amphibious living here, the same hippo species that lives in Africa today. When Trafalgar Square was exca excavated to build Nelson's Column and um, the National Gallery, um, the river gravels there were found to be full of the bones of those herbivores, but also the bones of scimitar cats, great cats with enormous fangs, of, of hyenas, crocuta crocuta, the spotted hyena, the same one that lives in Africa today, 
and lions. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, there were lions in Trafalgar Square long before Sir Edmund Landseer got to work. The lion, like elephants if you look across the species, like rhinos if you look across the species, was not a tropical animal or a temperate animal or a polar animal. It was a universal animal. All of those taxa lived everywhere except Australasia, throughout the entire world. Australasia had its own megafauna, by the way. Alongside these, these elephants and rhinos and, and lions, alongside all sorts of other astonishing monsters, <coughs> um, there are lions still to this day living and breeding in Novosibirsk Zoo in Siberia in outdoor enclosures at temperatures of minus 50. Perfectly happy. The only reason why we consider these species to be tropical species today is that we've wiped them out everywhere else. And because they're confined to a few diminishing pockets in the tropics, we think, oh, those are tropical species. But we had a megafauna. Everywhere on Earth had a megafauna, on land and at sea. 1776, Oliver Goldsmith described the arrival of the herring, as seen from the English shore. And in those days, you could see, because it appears the seas all around Britain were clear. They were clear for several reasons. One, less soil erosion, refer to the soil culture exhibition. Um, two, um, because um, there was pretty well a continuous crust of sessile life right the way across the seabed. This was before most trawling and dredging was taking place. Um, oysters predominantly, but many other bivalve species, plus loads of soft corals, sea pens, sea fans, all sorts of stuff which was stabilising the sediments and filtering the water column. Um, one rough estimate suggests that the amount of oysters in the North Sea was probably sufficient, more or less, to filter the entire water column every three days. So the sea, it seems, was crystal clear. The main body of the herring, Oliver Goldsmith reported, was divided into columns each five or six miles long and three or four miles wide. They rolled up the water ahead of them. In other words, they created a bow wave. Behind the herring came the cod. Not the cod we know today, the cod they knew then. Behind the cod, the smaller sharks, the spur dog, the tope, the smooth hounds. Behind them, the large sharks of a wide range of species, blues, threshers, poor beagles, makos, and now we believe great whites as well. Alongside them, the tuna, the longfin tuna and the bluefin tuna, vast shoals of bluefin tuna, thousand pound tuna, crashing in to the, the bait bulls of herring around the English coast. Alongside them, the dolphins and the porpoises, again, <coughs> several different species, and behind them, within sight of the English shore, the pods of fin whales and sperm whales. We had a megafauna at sea as well. And some of the richest coastal waters in the world all wiped out. So comprehensive is our forgetting. So comprehensive is shifting baseline syndrome that even many professional ecologists are unaware of what went before. Paleoecology, the study of past kingdoms, is a portal through which you may pass into an enchanted kingdom. It informs us of not only what happened before, not only of what we are missing today, but also of how we might better manage our, or engage with the natural world in the future. Because without understanding what prevailed in the past, we simply cannot understand what we are looking at today, and we cannot understand how magnificently misguided, irrational, unambitious, and anally retentive today's conservation is. Until you understand paleoecology, and until you grasp 
the extraordinary ecological processes which show you that certain keystone species, critically important animals, ecological engineers, such as, for example, the beaver, the boar, the wolf, the lynx, are absolutely essential to the functioning of ecological processes right down through the food chain. You cannot understand what a healthy ecosystem looks like. You cannot see that an ecosystem that is missing those keystone species behaves in radically different ways to an ecosystem that retains them. You cannot see how amazingly perverse and counterproductive conservation in this country has become. Conservation has become about locking in the past. We need to move to a future, a brighter future, and that process is called rewilding. Rewilding, the mass restoration of ecosystems that Alan will describe in more detail, is for me an essential move towards better ecological understanding, better ecological application, and something just as important to all of us, I think, a positive environmentalism. It's not just that we are missing keystone species in this country, though some of them are coming back. Today I went to see the Mid-Devon beaver project in an undisclosed location. Not, not the beavers on the River Otter, which is another very exciting development. This was um, an undisclosed location where within a large enclosure, which may become a larger and larger enclosure until it's no longer an enclosure, um, beavers had been set to work on a tiny little trickle of a stream. Alan and I we're taken round this by the wonderful Derek Gow and, and by academics at Exeter University um, and the Devon Wildlife Trust. And uh, we saw this complete transformation where this tiny trickle, as a result of the 13 staggered stepped dams that the beavers had created, had been turned into this great extensive woodland, the uh, wetland um, with, with, with um, car, where wetland woods, um, coming out of it, with trees half toppled, half growing, re-sprouting, forming this amazingly complex mosaic of open water, of, 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 of water um, covered by marshy plants and marginals, of water across which trees had fallen, of bits of grass, of bits of other vegetation, this fantastic complexity, while at the same time holding back not only the water, which would otherwise have rushed downstream during the floods, but also all the phosphates, nitrates and pesticides which the farmer immediately upstream had been dumping on his land. This extraordinary transformation, creating habitats for loads of species which weren't living there before, everything from frogs in great profusion to woodcock and snipe making use of the new marshy habitats which, which the beavers had created, and at the same time, um, helping us, helping the, the, the settlements downstream to avoid flooding, helping to keep the land, uh, the, the soil on the land, helping to prevent um, the contaminants getting into the reservoir which supplies many people's water in this part of the world. All this was being done by the beavers who had transformed their environment. That is what a keystone species <coughs> does. A keystone species is one whose ecological impact is greater than its biomass, its, its, its sort of total <coughs> um, uh, weight of, of species alone <coughs> would suggest. And without those species, we are missing all the structure and function of our ecosystems. We, without those species, we live in a shadow land, a dim, flattened relic of what there once was and what there could be again. And what I'm trying to come to here is to say that it's not just the keystone species that we are missing. <coughs> it's not just the ecological processes we are missing. It's not just the structure and function and dynamism we are missing. It's something just as important to us, a commodity called hope. And if you are trying to persuade people to love and care for the living world, an ounce of hope is worth a ton of despair. But what have we been telling people as environmentalists? You know, and I'm not for a moment suggesting we stop campaigning against the bad stuff. We've got to. But we, we also have to temper that by campaigning for the good stuff. But by and large, our message has been, follow us and the world will be slightly less crap than it was before. 
not exactly an inspiring message. Of course, there are exceptions. The network of well-being is one of them. Transition towns is another one. These are great examples of positive environmentalism, but we need far more. And in fact, what I've begun to discover is that when you start to create a vision for a better world, people want to get all the bad stuff out of the way much more urgently. Because they say, let's just clear all this, stop all this destruction and rubbish so we can get to this better world. We, what a positive environmentalism, of which rewilding is one example, offers is, is an exchange. Because we're saying to people, look, there are certain things we don't want you to do anymore. We don't want you to keep flying all over the world. We don't want you to keep eating vast quantities of meat. We don't want you to keep burning so much fossil fuel. Um, that our, we don't want you to, to kill all these rare species. But what are we giving people in return? We're saying we want to limit those freedoms, but where are the freedoms we're giving them in return? How about a vision of a magnificent, thriving ecosystem in which you can lose yourself on your doorstep without having to travel halfway around the world first? How about bringing to, into our lives, as well as into the ecosystem, the wildness, which I believe we're missing? How about curing us of what I think is one of the greatest afflictions of modern society, ecological boredom? And that, to me, is as much the essence of rewilding as the equally important um, effort to, to value the intrinsic qualities of nature and allow living systems to recover by bringing back some of the crucially important species, by allowing the trees and the other deep vegetation and complex habitats to return, allow this inherently complex system to behave and function as a complex system with all these emergent adaptive qualities that complex systems have as opposed to turning it into a simple system so that we can understand it so that we can have predictable outputs from our predictable inputs like cutting, burning and grazing. That's what conservation groups are doing in this country, turning what is inherently a complex system into a simple system. And, and, and rewilding, which you know, a few years ago was... You know, an extremely obscure idea, but is now becoming more and more mainstream. This, to me, is an absolutely essential means of reclaiming our place in the world as well as reclaiming the world itself. And, and to this end, um, a group of us have set up a group called Rewilding Britain, which um, will have several functions, one to sort of tr make the argument for it and explain it to people um, and, and try to clear away some of the institutional barriers, some of the political barriers, and at the same time also to champion groups like Allens, which are doing it on the ground and to make life easier for them to communicate what they're doing, um, to do the sort of thing we're doing today. I helped to found Rewilding Britain, I don't run it, but, but this is what uh, uh, among the things that we are trying to do. And we want to bring back as much as we can politically, as much as is possible. Um, ecologically, we could do much of this stuff tomorrow. We could introduce wolves to Plymouth tomorrow. They'd be perfectly happy foraging out of your dustbins. It might not work politically very well. And I'm not suggesting it, I, I hasten to add, I'm not suggesting that we bring back wolves to Plymouth. Um, the Scottish Highlands might be suitable, however. But the barriers, what I'm trying to say, are political barriers rather than ecological barriers. The kind of things I've been talking about, like the common agricultural policy, like the current pattern, or at least uh, the disposition of landholding and the way that that operates and the culture which that has currently created. These are the sort of institutional barriers uh, which I feel should be navigated and, and explored. Um, and, and the overriding purpose of this is, is to, to um, allow us to see that a better world is possible. A better world is not just possible, but if we get behind it, it is plausible, it is probable. The aim of rewilding this, this, this form of uh, engagement with nature which, look, which looks to the future rather than to the past is to replace our silent spring with a raucous summer. Thank you. Returning to the question of um, livestock farming, bearing in mind that it takes 10 kilos of grain to produce one kilo of meat, 
and that they say that 70% of global warming is down to livestock um, doing what comes naturally. Is there any argument for, well, doing away with livestock farming altogether, do you think? Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, first of all, uh, it's a crucially important um, question and a crucially important topic. 70% um, I don't believe is the correct figure. The one that the um, UNFAO uses is 14.5%, which is slightly higher than all the greenhouse gas emissions from transport. So it's a hugely important source of greenhouse gases, even if it's not actually 70%. And I, I feel that um, it's absolutely essential that we eat far less livestock and livestock products. You know, not just less meat, but also less milk, uh, fewer eggs. Um, a, a lot of the um, effort um, of uh, people, very well-intentioned people, such as Hugh Fernley Whittingstall or Jamie Oliver, has been to say, you know, let's stop eating these intensively produced broiler chickens and battery pigs kept in such horrendous conditions, battery chickens producing eggs in such horrendous conditions. And of course, they're quite right. You know, it, it's horrible what's being done to those animals. But what they've been saying is we should switch to free range instead. Well, what you're doing there is swapping the animal welfare horrors for some environmental horrors. Um, and you know, we sort of tend to think, oh, free range is great. Well, I hope I've demonstrated uh, to some extent that free range sheep keeping is slightly less than great in terms of its environmental impacts. But the same applies, uh, though in different ways, to um, pigs and chickens. Um, uh, uh, pigs often totally, when they're kept in, in outdoor enclosures, wreck the soil structure. Um, compact it, erode it, cause muddy floods downstream, laden with nitrates, loads of problems then for freshwater ecosystems and indeed marine ecosystems when all the poo goes out to sea, creates dead zones. Um, uh, free range chickens um, lay down a scorching carpet of phosphate which washes off the land and into the rivers when it, whenever it rains. And, and so the obvious conclusion from this is we just should be eating a lot less of all those animal products. It's not um, so much a question of how it's produced, it's a fact of its production. And when you see that the livestock population is growing at twice the rate of the human population and at four times the weight of the human population in terms of its growth rate, you see that that's a really big problem. Um, I mentioned earlier the human population is now 7.3 billion. It's scheduled to go up to, I think, between 9 and 10 by the middle of the century. And the physical capacity of the planet is not possible to support that many large carnivores. It's just not possible. We need to learn to eat lower on the food chain. And if rewilding is going to become successful, and if we want to have populations of uh, large animals on the planet, we've got to give space for them. And at the moment, we're still using up more and more space with extensive and intensive agriculture. And all the, the large wildlife, the bison that used to roam the American plains, have been replaced by feedlot cattle who are fed soya beans from the Amazon former rainforest. So the meat-based lifestyle is driving a large part of the destruction of the planet at the moment. And I learned about this traveling in the 70s, and I made a conscious decision to become vegetarian and then vegan in 1979 because I wanted to reduce my ecological footprint. So um, not everybody needs to become vegan, perhaps. It might be too extreme for some, but it is a very important way for me to claim my power and reduce the negative impacts of my lifestyle and free up space for um, restoring wild lands in Scotland and elsewhere. Or if you want to eat pork chops, then grow your own, raise your own pig, as my grandfather did in, well, uh, in his backyard. That's back not necessarily a good solution. Oh. I mean, it's, uh, yes, if you're okay. raising it exclusively on scraps, which you aren't, of course, allowed to do nowadays, uh, but if you were to do that, then it would be fine, yeah. but actually you're still generally feeding it around pork chops. Uh, gentleman, uh, near to the lady, uh, with the, um, please, next question. Thank you. I'm a district councillor and for the South Hounds, which covers part of Dartmoor. And today we had a long-term planning meeting. So I suggested that we have two areas of oak woodland, which are double in size, and we reintroduce two species. Which two species should we start with here in Devon? Um, are you talking about species of tree or species um, any sort? Uh, two trees and two others. 
<laughs> two, two non trees. <laughs> two trees and two non others. Two others. Well, um, I'm not that familiar with the ecosystems down here, but I do know that uh, there are remnant oak woods on da uh, Dartmoor still, places like Wistman's Wood, which I visited last year. And I think there's scope for a lot more of that. And oak is very important because it supports a large range of other species, invertebrates, ferns, lichens, and mosses. So um, it may not be suitable to put oak in areas that have been deforested for a while. You might need to go through a natural succession process, but that's certainly one I would recommend. In terms of other species, uh, George mentioned earlier, we went to look at some beavers today, and uh, they're doing very good work. And there's a lot of scope, in my view, um, to have beavers in many other parts around here that would bring a lot of added benefits um, both in terms of water regu flowing, regulating the water flow and providing benefits for other wildlife such as frogs, herons and things like that, uh, dragonflies, all the things that benefit from uh, the habitat modification that beavers do. Um, those are two that spring to mind. I don't know, do you want to add another well, two, George? Well, I'd just like to add that when we were, we were visiting Derek Scaff today, um, we, we saw not only the beavers that he's been breeding for, for release, but also the storks that he's been breeding, cranes, um, uh, wild cats uh, that you, you mentioned in, in your talk. I mean, Derek is this extraordinary force of nature, in more than one sense, who is just trying to do everything he possibly can to bring back some of the crucial missing components of our ecosystem. And um, he, he, he's a local man. We should be giving him our support. Wait, wait for the, for the microphone. microphone. <laughs> it's on its way. <laughs> Might be a silly question, but um, isn't it dangerous to introduce wild cats? <laughs> um, and wouldn't that put people off walking and enjoying the moors? <laughs> Are you you're suggesting it is dangerous to have wild cats, that they're a risk to people and to dogs? Yeah. I'm sorry, there's no substance to that whatsoever. <laughs> wild cats. Um, where they exist are incredibly shy and elusive. They're very hard to see. They avoid people at all costs. And they're, they're also not very big. I mean, they're yeah. about twice the weight of a, of a, of a domestic cat. Um, and, and, you know, they'll, they'll take a baby deer, wouldn't they? I mean, a very small one, a fawn. I, they no, wouldn't take they, they wouldn't even do that. Uh, no. There have been one or two records of it, but, you know, they're not, not, not much bigger than that. <laughs> <laughs> Since we have the microphone down here, the gentleman behind Thanks. Uh, question for Alan. Um, you mentioned about sort of the change in Scotland with the with the rise of the SNP. How much demonstrated um, commitment from the government has there been to actually roll out wide wide scale rewilding in Scotland, given that you proved that it's possible and so easy? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Um, it's not easy to answer. Um, in some ways, there is commitment to it. We have something in Scotland uh, called the Scottish Rural Development Programme, which disperses European money. And that's one of the main sources that we use for funding some of our tree planting work. And there's possible to get grants from that, which allow us to fence areas and plant trees, and all the costs are covered. And there's quite a bit of money available for that. And other landowners and other conservation groups are doing that as well. Um, however, that scheme is primarily focused still on the forestry industry <laughs> and the bulk of the money goes to commercial forestry and the guidelines for native woodland restoration still have too much um, influence from commercial forestry background so it's a partial step I think things are very much in the balance at the moment we've got uh, as I mentioned before this thing about beavers um, I met with the Minister for the Environment last summer with some other representatives from NGOs to make the case for widespread beaver reintroduction. They're sitting on a decision just now. They've been sitting on it since May last year. And we're hoping they'll make the right decision. And that will be more of a bellwether. If they say yes, then I can answer your, your question more positively. But it's a bit uncertain at the moment because they're, they've not yet announced the outcome of their deliberations. They've had reams and reams of reports, huge stacks of technical reports given to them from the Scottish beaver trial in Argyll in analysing the ecological and the economic impact of the beavers, almost all of which are positive. 
Um, but there's you know, a few people waving big flags of unhappiness, you know, some farmers whose land got flooded and that sort of thing, and angling concerns which don't really have any substance to them. So if we can get the beavers back, I think it will, uh, if, I, if I use perhaps a slightly inappropriate analogy, it will open the floodgates <laughs> for potentially the lynx, the next one, and perhaps for more widespread rewilding efforts. Uh, we'll wait for the microphone, it's just coming. Thank you. I'm a horticulturist, by the way, too. All right. Um, Mr. Rees, I would like to ask, um, is the badger cull an excuse for covering up the uh, dockyard sludge spread on the land as fertilizers, especially in Plymouth Davenport dockyard, where toxic waste has been sprayed on there to cause BSE or whatever, and our highlands in, in the mid, mid um, Cornwall, North, North Cornwall? I don't really know enough to answer that. Well, I, I don't know about that particular topic, but I do know that the badger cull just doesn't stack up. I mean, it, the government spent £49 million investigating what the impact of the badger cull would be. This was the previous Labour government. This huge study it conducted. And what it showed unequivocally is that you make the problem worse by culling badgers, the problem of bovine TB, because you disperse those badgers. Um, we also now know, unequivocally, that the main um, transmission route for bovine TB is cow to cow, not badger to cow. Um, and the fact that we don't have proper quarantine periods, we don't have proper regulated cow move, cattle movements in this country, um, th these are what's driving the epidemic of bovine TB. But it's so much easier to blame the badger. And, and where I do see a parallel here is that you know, instead of taking the bull by the horns, so to speak, and actually um, dealing with the way in which cattle are, are managed in this country, it's much easier to blame the badger. When it comes to flooding, um, it, instead of saying, you know, we've got to deal with the whole catchments and the way that those are treated and the appalling mistreatment of them, which speeds up the water um, down, down, uh, down, that, down the course of the river, down to the nearest urban pinch point, flooding people's homes, um, uh, instead, we have this crazy call from the National Farmers Union and others to dredge the rivers to get the water off our land, the farmland, which means that you get it onto the towns instead. And, and there's this sort of blaming of nature again, and we, we must be allowed to destroy nature in order not to address the underlying problems. Talking about um, nuclear waste being spread on the land as fertilizer from the leaking submarines we have here. Um, it causes a BSE crisis in Haverley, which seeps down into our water tables on the Tamer. And our environmentalists, or DAFRA, seems to do nothing about it but blame badgers. And I think uh, it's a big cover up for this. And as we have now the highest cancer rates in England today, which we didn't have before this project, this multinational companies put this here. Um, um, you know, I, Thank you for telling us about this. I, 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 I wasn't aware of this, so I'll, I'll have, have a look into that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there another question? Yes, just in front. George, um, I have read um, uh, your book, Feral, and several blogs, in which you have said that uh, when you've spoken to people in national parks, that you've been surprised that a lot of them agree with what you're saying. Now, I, I cannot believe that it's legislation from the British government or the uh, European Parliament that is stopping them changing policy. So what the hell is it? What, what, is, what is the block? Well, uh, interestingly, I was invited, and fair play to them, um, to the UK Conference of National Parks in, in October, and I gave them I just blasted them. <laughs> um, um, and so, you know, what on earth are you up to? You know, here you are maintaining these ecological disaster zones and calling them national parks. And, and towards the very end of the talk, I said, look, I know that what I'm saying is unwelcome. And all these heads started going like this. And, 
I'm thinking, what? What is this? You know, I, was, I was just ready for a lynching at the end of this talk. Uh, but afterwards, you know, obviously it did cause controversy, and some people were pretty upset with what I said, but there were a lot of people who said, we just desperately need to be hearing this, and so glad you've said it. You know, and and this, is, this is the message we need to be getting out. So there's a real recognition that there's a problem. Um, and there's several things I think at play. One is being stuck in the old ways. And you know, this problem will partly be solved one retirement at a time. Um, uh, there's definitely a generational divide when it came to the perception of this. Um, because you know, people have done things in certain ways for generation after generation and these get passed on. It's partly there was very much a sort of landowner's perspective at work. I mean, the national park authorities tend not to own very much land themselves, but they, they, they have to set the policy across land which is owned by other people. And of course, the big landowners have, I think, a disproportionate say in how national parks are managed. Um, but yes, I mean, the, 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 there's several, you know, the, the, the farm subsidies issue definitely bears upon it. Um, another thing that, that bears upon it is. The, the, the way in which the entire fiscal infrastructure favours big and expanding land ownership. I mean, we're still consolidating land ownership. Um, land holdings are still getting bigger and fewer. And that's partly because you have inheritance tax exemption, you have capital gains tax exemption, you have first five years of income tax exemption. This is outrageous. Yeah, this is, uh, th these are uh, uh, subsidies for speculative land owning. Um, and, and they prevent the land being used for better purposes and for being more widely <coughs> distributed. Um, but, and, and all that is, is coupled with just this, with the shifting baseline syndrome, with cultural hegemony, with, with this failure to stand back and see the bigger picture. And you know, I don't think, on the, for the most part, it's deliberately obtuse on the part of national park authorities. It's fallen into this mindset, which they seem to find very hard to break out of. Uh, I just add a little bit from a Scottish perspective. Um, Scotland, for until relatively recently, had the ignominious distinction of no national parks. We were in the company of Iraq and Albania until we got national parks in 1999. Landowning interests blocked them for so long. We do have two national parks now, but uh, the one that's closest to me, the Cairngorms National Park, was set up with a four-point um, agenda, only one of which is nature conservation. One is economic development, one is promoting recreation, and the other, I think, is tourism or something like that. And it means that whereas national parks in other parts of the world um, are category one or two, I think it is in UN terms, um, ours are all, are all in category four or five. All which, in five. All, yeah, in five. all in five, yes, which is um, ones in which human activities predominate and nature conservation almost happens as a byproduct of that. And that's what we've got in Scotland. Um, the Cairngorms National Park has very good committee staff members, but they are totally hamstrung by the, uh, the establishment of the National Park. And that means that we've got things like a new town across the Spey River from Aviemore being planned with 1,500 houses, most of which will be holiday homes only used for part of the year, being built in a Caledonian forest remnant, destroying wood ant nests and all of that in the, the name of development of a national park. Uh, category 5 incidentally was invented to accommodate British national parks because they simply didn't fit with the idea of national parks at all. Uh, it, it would be quite a suitable designation for multi-story car parks as well because that's about the, the, the level of ecological diversity that, that it recognizes. Um, but I heard recently from the International Union for, for Conservation of Nature that even the Category 5 ranking is now at risk because our national parks are in such appalling ecological condition. Were they to be challenged, because they're nearly all designated, have conservation designations that across most of their land area, uh, were they to be challenged under the European Union Habitats Directive, were you to take the National Park Authorities um, to court under that directive for failing to keep their habitats in favorable conservation status, every one of them would lose the case. <coughs> Um, I'm sorry, George, you're quite wrong about cattle-to-cattle -cattle transmission being the main route of spread of TB. 
I do know about this because I'm a vet. I worked for something like 17 years part-time on TB with DEFRA. Um, during most of that time, I would condemn half a dozen cattle to death every week. And in all my time, I only found two cows that were open cases whereby the possibility of them transmitting disease was there. Of all the rest of the reactors, half of them had no evidence of disease, and the rest had the um, <clears throat> disease walled off in the lymph nodes. So I think it's a complete red herring saying cattle to cattle transmission is important. Uh, I think it is nearly all badgers, but I don't agree with the way the badger cull is being conducted. It's a huge waste of time, and I think it's very wrong to kill so many badgers without doing it in such a way that makes a difference. Well, th thank you for that. I, I can't compete, obviously, with your knowledge and experience of the issue. I, I base my comments on research by um, um, uh, researchers at the Zoological Society of London who had, who had studied the phenomenon. Uh, one thing I would add to it is that in Australia, they took an entirely different approach, which was to have a very strict quarantine regime, and they wiped bovine TB out. Uh, microphone because it's being recorded. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, if you excuse me while I've read my question, if that's okay, because I tend to ramble sometimes. Um, it's been really reassuring not to have encountered uh, uh, an anti-human sentiment that some environmental discourses can imply tonight, and I, I thank you for that. Uh, indeed, it's been a delight to hear you binding issues of social justice with those of environmental justice. So, um, could you say some more about the place of humans within this rewilded landscapes that you're imagining, and do humans have to remain absent from them, or, and, or can you imagine a place for repopulating alongside rewilding? Thank you for that question. Um, a very good one. Uh, I think there's a number of different answers to it. I think. Um, You'll have seen from what I spoke about earlier, in my view, the human component is essential to the rewilding process. If by some miracle all humans were saying, okay, we're going to leave the planet, we're going to migrate to the moon or somewhere else, the planet would recover. <laughs> Natural forces would reassert themselves and biodiversity would recover again. But that's obviously not going to happen. And uh, that recovery process is impaired in many places, but we can actually assist and accelerate it and reconnect ourselves along the way. The other part of your question about, you know, is there a place to repopulate areas, um, I think that's maybe possible in some places, but I would like to think that as human beings we would also be prepared to stand back and say we don't need to live everywhere. Because at the moment that's the, that's the overriding thrust of our culture, and I see it up in the north of Scotland, the expansion of our towns and cities, and everywhere else in the world I go. <laughs> and there's very few places where the full complement of species and natural processes can function because people are there and we come and we want our cars and our roads and our infrastructure and everything else. So um, I think it would be very good if we had a little bit of humility to say actually we don't need to live everywhere and in many places, places like the northwest of Australia for instance which I've traveled in, um, people are only there because of massive infrastructure developments that support them. The land cannot support people living a modern lifestyle. Everything has to be trucked in over large distances. So the other answer to my question is yes I think I could imagine people being able to live in some areas where they no longer live but the challenge I would pose to us, are we willing to live there on nature's terms and not impose modern day industrial consumer lifestyle values because that's what's getting us into trouble at the moment. Are we prepared to live more simply again and within the carrying capacity of the land because that's what's really asked of us. Hi, yeah. um, I'm a student here um, and I often have conversations with fellow students and other people about nature as a whole. So my question is, stems from philosophy. If you have some kind of low-lying fruit, a statement to try and get people engaged with nature, maybe the, the course that they study or the life that they've led up to 
the young age of something like me, like 20, 21, has meant that they haven't really engaged in nature. Is there some kind of case study or you know, a couple of sentences that you say, look, come, come see this wider environment, get engaged in wider debate and come to talks like this? Is, is there something that you, that you would say to them? Uh, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Are you thinking as a two-sentence summary or something like that? It doesn't have to be two sentences, just something you'd get to say, look, come and experience the wider world uh, and nature. Have, have you got something that you would say to people to draw people in? Um, I would say, I've touched on it a little bit, I think, in some of the slides I showed, about this, the benefit for people. Because um, like it or not, we're still very anthropocentric. I like to think we're moving towards more of a biocentric perspective, to use philosophical terms, deep ecology, uh, all species have equal rights and so forth, but we're still human. So we look at things from a human point of view. So yes, people can come and plant trees with us and make a positive difference, but they actually gain a tremendously nourishing and fulfilling experience. And I think it would be those two things, you know, if I boiled it down to an essence, come and do something very positive and practical for the earth to help rewilding, recovery of natural ecosystems, and as you do so, receive something of profound value and importance for yourself that is potentially life-changing. Uh, something I would add to that is that a crucial component we haven't discussed is the world that we create for our children, not, not just for the children in times to come, but for our children right now. But when you look at how planning is conducted, children don't feature in it at all. Um, it's all uh, done amongst adults, the provision is for adults, as the adults who buy the houses, the children have no say. And so you see, you know, even the new housing estates have no provision for children. The shared space is all for car parking. There's nowhere for them to play. There's nowhere for them to form the tribes, which is absolutely an essential component of childhood. So they can run out of their homes safely and all play together without adult supervision. It's essential to learn a whole load of social skills and physical skills. And then, of course, um, in the wider world beyond, there are so few places where they can go unaccompanied beyond their own estate, beyond um, the, the immediate vicinity of their homes, uh, where parents feel um, uh, they can safely let them go. Now, of course, there's paranoia. We, we have unfounded fears. We also have better founded fears, traffic in particular, the danger of traffic accidents. But even if you get past that, um, there are two big problems. Uh, one, there often aren't very interesting places for children to go. They have all been built on. Um, the ones um, a little further afield from where they live very often. But um, two, um, if the other children aren't doing it and you don't reach a critical mass, um, that makes your child very exposed if they're the only one who, who are going out to the woods and who do they play with when they get there. Um, and and, and I, I feel you know, it's crucial that we see rewilding at all sorts of levels, small-scale urban rewilding, um, slightly bigger rewilding on the fringes of the towns, and then in, in the big open, currently open areas in the uplands, much larger scale rewilding, but places which are accessible, crucially importantly, to children as well as to adults. If we want to rewild the world, we must also rewild the child.